Great. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we are, we'll get started, and then we will go to our guests uh, very quickly under Secretary Lung Yu Jimin of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. Um, during a Security Council meeting this morning on peace operations and human rights, Michel Bachelet, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, said that as, of co that as COVID-19 continues to gather pace, its impacts on health, societies, economies, threaten development, and amplifies or creates new grievances and tensions. She said that the human rights components integrated in all UN peace operations bring missions closer to the people they serve. Only action to address the human rights violations inflicted on people can prevent the recurrence of conflict, she said. The UN peace operations are among the organization's most significant achievements, especially uh, added. She called on council members to ensure that missions have the resources they need, as well as strong political support, to bind together all UN operations around a common, effective approach to crisis, from prevention to recovery. The head of the UN peacekeeping mission in South Sudan, David Shearer, also spoke at the same council meeting. He reiterated the importance of human rights in the implementation of his mission's mandate. And you will have seen that we issued a statement uh, yesterday afternoon in which the Secretary General said he is deeply saddened by the reported deaths of at least 40 people following flooding in a landslide in Kumamoto in Japan's Kyushu region. The Secretary General expressed his deep condolences to the families of the victims as well as to the people and government of Japan. And we would also like to offer our condolences following the death of two humanitarian mine clearance workers on Sunday in southern Tripoli. We continue to be concerned about the con ongoing threat posed by explosive devices left behind in civilian neighborhoods in southern Tripoli. Since late last May, these devices have reportedly killed or injured 80, killed and injured 81 civilians and 57 non-civilians, including mine clearance workers. And I have an update for you from Mali, also unfortunately involving mines. Yesterday morning in the town of Kidal, a vehicle from the UN peacekeeping mission there, a part of a logistics convoy hit a mine. Three peacekeepers were injured, including one who sustained serious injuries. We wish them a speedy recovery and are following up on this incident. And we want to thank our good friends in the Republic of Korea for their decision to contribute 60,000 face masks to support our efforts to combat the coronavirus pandemic in two UN peacekeeping missions. And those are the mission in South Sudan and the one in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We welcome the Republic of Korea's strong participation in and support for peacekeeping and look forward to the peacekeeping ministerial, which will, the country will host in 2021. The Secretary General was informed by the permanent mission in early June that it would take uh, place from the 8th to the 9th of April in Seoul, obviously subject to any changes uh, involving the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, we continue to work uh, with member states and missions to strengthen the medical systems and preventive measures, social distancing, proper hygiene, and the use of personal protective equipment is our first line of defense against the virus. The response of our UN peacekeeping missions to COVID-19 remains guided by four main objectives, to protect our personnel and their capacity to continue critical operations, to help contain and mitigate the spread of the virus, and ensuring that our own people are not a contag contagion vector, and to support national authorities as possible in their response to the virus. And of course, to help protect vulnerable communities, and continue to deliver on our mandate. And in South Sudan, the UN peacekeeping mission there is training young community influencers to raise awareness on COVID-19 in eastern Equatoria. The training sessions were held in communities where awareness raising had not been previously conducted. The trainees will educate others about behavioral risks during the pandemic so that local communities can work together to prevent the spread of the virus. Protests, excuse me, posters and information brochures in multiple languages are among the tools being used and disseminated. And in Zambia, uh, we, along with our partners, continue to work with the government to respond to the pandemic and its impacts. We've helped 166 healthcare facilities and isolation centers improve their water 
sanitation, hygiene infrastructure, and have provided chlorine hand washing stations as well as medical waste bins. Our colleagues on the ground are helping procure 10 ventilators as well. And we're also helping to distribute hygiene supplies to more than 700 schools and help produce child-friendly messages on COVID-19 to air over the radio in local languages. More than a million people have been reached with messages on safe hygiene practices, gender-based violence services, and virus prevention. Starting this month, the UN will provide cash transfers to some 656,000 vulnerable and food insecure people in the next six months in Zambia. And our colleagues at the UN Refugee Agency said today that more than 3,000 refugees from the Democratic Republic of the Congo arrived in Uganda between Wednesday and Friday last week during a temporary opening of two border crossing points in northwest Uganda. UNHCR and its partners have provided essential items, including tents, water tanks, toilets, and others, to uh, help the refugees. UNHCR welcomes a decision taken by the Ugandan government to allow the group of refugees to enter the country and receive life-saving help, as well as protection. The refugee agency says that this effort demonstrates how through quarantines, health screenings, and other measures, states can uphold their obligations under international law during the pandemic while at the same time limiting the potential transmission of the virus. And the high-level political forum on sustainable development began today with the theme of accelerated action and transform transformative pathways, realizing the decade of action and delivery for sustainable development. The forum this year is examining the severe impacts of the pandemic on the progress in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and Sustainable Development Goals. Today's opening session examined how the SDGs can serve as a guidepost for building back better, leaving no one behind. It also highlighted the importance of international solidarity and a multilateral response to the pandemic, regional dimensions in countries at different levels of development, including middle-income countries, data and institutions for integrated policymaking were also in focus during the morning session. And this afternoon, the HLPF will convene to discuss protect uh, protecting and advancing human well-being and ending poverty, ending hunger and achieving food security. And related to this, shortly after I'm finished and you're finished with me, we'll hear from our guest from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, as I mentioned, Liu Zhenmin, the Undersecretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, who is with us, along with Francesca Perucci, the Chief of the Statistical Services Branch, and Yun Yi Min, the Chief of the Sustainable Development Goals Monitoring Section, and they will be here to discuss the key findings of the 2020 Sustainable Development Goals Report, which was launched today at the opening of the HLPF. And I wanted to flag an interesting and new, new and timely series put together by our colleagues in the Department of Global Communications Outreach Program on the trans transatlantic slave trade, the Holocaust, and the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Tomorrow at 11 a.m., they will host, launch a live virtual discussion series named Beyond the Long Shadow, Engaging with Difficult Histories. The aim of the series is to develop a deeper understanding of the legacies of these painful histories and to consider how to best build a world that is just where all can live in dignity and peace. In the first episode, an expert panel will consider what role statues, memorials, and museums and memorialization after atrocity crimes might play in furthering the interest of justice. And yesterday we mentioned the beginning of the virtual counterterrorism week. Today I want to flag that the Counterterrorism Center has launched a virtual ex exhibit that showcases its work to prevent and counter terrorism and violent extremism through capacity building around the world. And we will send uh, the links for those two events uh, to you right after the briefing. And finally, we give a hearty thank you to our friends in the Marshall Islands for their full payment to this year's regular budget, which brings us up to the beautiful number of 103. So uh, before we go to our guest, I'm happy to take a few questions. Well, I don't know if I'm happy, but I will take a few questions. Uh, Ibtisam. Uh, hi, Stefan. Thank you for the briefing. I have uh, two questions. The first one on Syria and on the resolution that the cross border the resolution that the Security Council is supposed to vote. Do you have any comments? Do you 
Uh, well, I mean, you what know, do you we, it's, it's not a matter of comment. It's just a matter of reiterating what we have said repeatedly, that the cross, uh, the cross, the, excuse me, that the cross-border crossings are vital uh, to the well-being of the civilians uh, in northwest uh, Syria. Um, and we very much hope that these will be uh, extended. It is, uh, you know, lives depend on it. Um, a follow-up uh, on, so w there is a chance that the uh, uh, data will be used. Do you, what, what would that mean for you and for humanitarian? I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't want to go into kind of the hypothetical of what the resolution will actually look like. I just, at this point, I can only restate what our general principal position is on this, and I think it's been expressed by the Secretary General. It's been expressed very publicly uh, by Mark Lowcock. Uh, as well. Let's see what the council comes up with. Uh, James. Yes, you'll be aware that, that uh, Special Rapporteur Agnes Kalamart um, on extrajudicial killings has come up with a new report um, saying that the, uh, the strike against General Soleimani uh, earlier this year was uh, a breach of the UN Charter. Um, does the Secretariat have a response to that? No, it's not for us to respond. I think our um, our reaction uh, was recorded at the time, and I have nothing to add to what Ms. Calamar has said in her in her uh, understandable role as a uh, as a special independent special rapporteur. She obviously makes recommendations, as she does in these reports. One of them is to the Secretariat. Um, it says the Secretary General should set up international inquiries or fact-finding missions to investigate targeted killings by drones. Is it something the Secretary General will consider? I mean, she's, well, she's clearly not just worried about this case. No, she's worried about the I use think, of drones widely. We, we are, I think we have expressed our concern about uh, the use of drones. We've expressed our concerns about extrajudicial killings wherever they occur. I would also underscore the, the Secretary General's very vocal uh, concern about the use of artificial intelligence, the risk of use of weapons that are not, uh, that have no human control on, on them, and the increased use of technology uh, in warfare. Obviously, we will, uh, we will take a look at her specific uh, recommendations. Uh, Edie, please. Um, thank you, Steph. I was also going to ask about cross-border, but I will also ask about Libya and uh, what has been going on in terms of trying to bring the parties together, trying to talk to their backers. Um, everything uh, seems... I mean, we're, we're continuing, obviously, to deliver the same messages, talking to the parties, talking to the backers. Um, as, as one example, uh, yesterday, the, special, the acting special representative, Stephanie Williams, uh, joined the chairman of the Libyan National Oil Cooperation, uh, Mustafa uh, Sanala, at a uh, meeting of the working group on international follow-up committee on Libya, um, which focused on, uh, on the economic, uh, on com economic issues. The group reiterated its full support um, uh, for the Libyan National Oil Company, and welcomed the chairman's presentation plans on how to resume oil operations. You know that uh, the resumption of oil operations is critical uh, for, Lib for, the Lib for, the, for the government uh, to receive funds from which the people uh, should be able to benefit. Uh, the working group also called on the mission to intensify its work in support of the intra-Libyan economic dialogue track, uh, which is very critical on building consensus on key economic issues to promote uh, something very important, which is financial transparency. And any um, indication of when we might hear of a replacement for Ghassan Salome? Uh, no, ma'am. And I will uh, repeat uh, what I've said, which is, in, in the meantime, uh, the mission has strong leadership in the person of uh, Stephanie Williams. Um, I see I had a question, I think, from... Uh, from Martin Wang at uh, Xinhua. Martin? All right. Uh, I will read the, read the question. 
which is Chinese ambassador yesterday deposited China's instrument of accession to the arms trade treaty. Uh, what's the comment? Obviously, it's a very welcome uh, step. I think the more member states, uh, the more the membership is included in the global arms trade treaty, uh, the better off we all are in, uh, in fighting um, the scourge of illegal uh, weapons on the international uh, market and strengthening uh, the arms trade uh, architecture. Uh, James, you had another question? Yeah, just following up on Libya, um, clearly um, you mentioned Ghassan Salame, and we've talked about his comment on the Security Council stabbing um, him in the back. Um, there is the uh, regular um, Security Council briefing on Libya coming up tomorrow. I'm told that some of the participants will be at a reasonably high level because this is the German presidency in Germany leading the Berlin process. Given what... Um, SRSG, former SRSG Salame said, what is the Secretary General's message to the Security Council as they gather again to discuss Libya? Well, the message is, is one of needed unity in the Security Council to make sure that uh, there is this council supports with one voice uh, this Libyan-led uh, process of political, uh, political, political talks. Um, and also, you will be hearing from the Secretary General tomorrow because the plan is, as far as I understand, that he will brief uh, the Council on uh, on Libya tomorrow. All right. Uh, I hope we can now turn to our uh, guest, Under Secretary General. Um, as I mentioned, I will leave you in Farhan's hands, but you have the floor, and uh, welcome to this virtual briefing. 